Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here again. I'm a mathematician by training, but I've been working on the microbiome for about 20 years. And the big barrier I found is communication. But it turns out the new generation of microbiologists are much more quantitatively inclined and like to use the computer. So I'm happy about that. And maybe um, we have ways of communicating in, in spite of not having exactly the same background. Um, so I develop mathematical and statistical tools, but I al also develop software. And today I'm going to talk about various challenges which have to do with the dependencies in the bacterial communities that we see. And also one of the themes that comes back, um, it was uh, present for Marin, um, but also Janet's talk talked about a multi-domain, multi-way, multi-table data. And I think one of the big things and the challenges from a statistical viewpoint or a mathematical viewpoint is the heterogeneity of the data that we're trying to bring to bear on the problem. So it contains both um, data which accounts, frequencies, identification. We can compute all kinds of distances. And I think that um, it's very hard to think through all the levels of heterogeneity. First of all, I want to thank my main collaborator, who is David Relman, who um, I've worked with for more than 15 years. We work on pregnancy um, and various kinds of other perturbations. We look at antibiotic and colonic cleanout and diet perturbation studies, which we design. And um, they're funded by the NIH. So the challenges that we have, and one of the things, one of the dependencies which comes up a lot and Li Ping mentioned it, is that you can't prove causality without doing a longitudinal experiment in which you have a perturbation. And that's due to the fact that mainly, uh, from a statistical viewpoint, the main source of variability is subject to subject variability. So each subject has to be their own control, or each location um, should be their own control. And that's a challenge, but um, that creates the dependencies. And the other challenges are, how do we keep all the data together. That is, we have graphs and trees. You'll see metabolic networks and phylogenetic trees. And um, we want to be able to keep this um, and the links between all the parts um, together. So that's a challenge. And let me just tell you the way I think about it and some of the things that I'm going to try to explain to you ahead of time. Um, one of it has been very useful, and that's the notion of a mixture. And I'll try to say to you a little bit more where these mixtures come from. And the other one, which is something that people don't necessarily know the word for, but think about, uh, definitely came up in Li Ping's talk, is that there are latent variables. Um, they're variables which aren't measured. And, um, and there are factors, for instance, in the soil, which are known to have an effect, but ne you don't necessarily measure them. So this latent variable, these hidden variables, are sort of what's underground and what explains the heterogeneity that we see. And we want to try and find and rediscover the latent variables. And that's the technology that I'll talk to you about today. So of course, the heterogeneity that happens is at many levels. If you're doing a like pregnancy and um, you know the term of the pregnancy, then you have a response that you know you want to explain. And it's a very easy problem. And now we do a lot of supervised learning for that. You can predict preterm. You can predict whether it's a tumor environment or not. You can predict um, diabetes or not. All of this using huge amounts of data, and you have a response. But in fact, uh, most of the time, we don't have a response. And the methods are unsupervised. And when people come and see me, they often have data, and they just say, what's going on? Um, and so it's an unsupervised situation. And the data that uh, we have are of many, many different types. So you can have you know, binary categorical data, but also graphs and trees and spatial information are really important. So this heterogeneity um, is one of the challenges and one of the things that you can solve using distances or various other kinds of statistical um, 
methods. So the examples I'm going to talk to you about, we have um, 16S uh, and DNA. And we also have metagenomic data. Um, we ha have RNA-seq data. I do a lot of metabolomics, so we have mass spec data, clinical data, and various kinds of environmental variables. Um, in the case of human, of course, it's nutrition or time. And then there's a lot of domain knowledge. Um, for instance, metabolic networks, phylogenetic trees, and gene ontologies. And of course, I'm not going to talk to you about all the methods of integrating data, but I will give you a flavor about how we think about it. So we think in layers. And the idea is if you see a probability de density and it looks like that, there's probably something hidden underneath. And uh, of course, the hidden variable here is the elephant, but you f find yourself, and I, I think of this, but this is how Marin works. Like that, you know, like that. That's how you work. And I, you have a problem with that, is there's only one Marin. And when you come to the problem of reproducible research, you need actually to say which order you were doing this and how are you doing it and what's the thing that you did there. And so there's this problem of making scripts or making a record of all the different paths, all the different things that we have to do to find the hidden variables. And that's what I'm interested in. So of course, I'm a knitter, so I, I think of it in terms of that mess. And the main path. Um, and the way I think about it, this is a wonderful cartoon by XKCD, in which you have, and most biologists think of statisticians as only using the thing on the left called the student's distribution. And what we're actually going to use is, on the right, you have something called the teacher's distribution. And that is a mixture. And that's what a mixture looks like. That is, it's many, many different peaks. And the peaks come from this underlying source that was hidden. So if you have a distribution like this, we call it trimodal. It means that, in fact, underlying, you have a factor which has three levels. There's a hidden layer. Now, you could say, OK, you have three different populations, or you just have one population, and there's a, a covariate which has three levels, but that's the way you can think about it. And you don't have to have a finite number of levels. You could have many, many different um, parts to your mixture. And this is the case of what we call a gamma poisson. And each of these distributions underneath it here is a poisson. And they each have their own personal um, parameter. And um, for statisticians, infinity starts at n the number of points on the number of samples you have. So if a mixture has six pieces and you only had five samples, it's infinite mixture. OK, so that's uh, um, So what we're after is some difference between our unknown parameters. And so it might be that you have a true prevalence of certain bacteria and trying to look at the difference. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about how we get these strains, um, these amplicon strain variants. But um, the amplicon strain variants are often the unit, and you want to see whether there's a difference in two, in, in two situations. And so then those um, prevalences are parameters. There. There's a true value which is unknown. And sometimes we encode the unknown, the fact that it's unknown, by making them random. But um, that, that's the sort of model that we think about. Now, to begin with, when we started doing this, there was the hope that you could do, like, in the genome, people were hoping, you know, one gene, one disease. Then you were hoping that you'd get differential abundance between the, there'd be this back one bacteria which would be responsible for, you know, a prevalence of um, diabetes or going up. We realized this wasn't true. That is, if you did things at the strain level, um, the person-person variability at the strain level doesn't allow you to do that because most people don't share the strains. And so you have to do it more at the topic level. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And I realize that what I'm going to call a topic is what Li Ping called a guild. And so here, I just want to make it very clear um, my paradigm for thinking about this uh, as a statistician is the following. Um, I think about um, the data as coming first. 
So I'm not a top-down modeler. So I'm not really a, a mathematician. I'm a statistician. So a statistician allows themselves to be wrong some of the time, but start with the data. And so I'm not going to try and make a mechanistic top-down model. I'm going to just try and start with the data. And from the data, I'm going to estimate some of the parameters um, in my model. And then um, this generative model will allow me to compute you know, probabilities, uncertainty quantification, and contours, and things like that. But that's my paradigm. It's a long paradigm to explain. And I've written a book called Modern Statistics um, for modern biology with Wolfgang Huber, and it's free online, and it, you know it's 400 pages, so there's a lot of detail that I'm going to leave out. So in the microbiome, we have these unknown parameters, and they might be, you know, these prevalences, as I said, and framing it that way allows us to make various models for our uncertainty about these, and in particular the gamma poisson is a favorite one. But there is some um, confusion. And so I said the most important thing might be your prevalences, the proportions here. But those proportions are not the data. The data come in as counts. They're reads. And actually, we do de novo. That is, we use those counts to define what the denoised um, strain variants are. So we actually don't know the number of possible strains in our data before we've done all of the denoising. So there's not. Uh, the data aren't compositional from the way that there's a theory of compositional data which says, you know, if you're looking at um, a chemical, an object which is made of chemical compounds, you have these 18 different chemical compounds and we'll, we'll say what proportion of those 18 in this 10 gram rock or soil. That's compositional data. In our case, the data aren't compositional because we can't tell you what the ASVs are ahead of time. And that's very important that from our point of view, the features, there are an infinite number of them. And because we're trying to study evolution of these features, of these strains, they think about the genomics of you know, infinite allele models. You have many, many more of them than you think when you start off. So that's very important in the mathematics. Um, and so you can't say, OK, the data aren't compositional, but the parameters are compositional, but the number of categories are, is infinite. The other thing is that, for instance, when I study antibiotics, the total bacterial load goes down uh, you know, in patients after the perturbation. So there's not a one hole which stays the same over time. And the other thing is, um, there's a huge um, problem with the fact that many of the ASVs later on will only occur once. And then afterwards, we have to drop them. So there's not, um, you know, sometimes in the data sets, you'll see minus one because they're unknown or they only occur once. That minus one might be a third of the data in one data set and a half of the data in another. That means that her, a third, you know, one. You have two thirds, and the other one you have a half. They're not the same one. So again, the data are definitely not compositional. You do have to deal with the fact that we have different numbers of reads. And so in particular here, we have um, different samples. And those different reads, um, numbers of reads you know, th that occur, you know, we have four. 400,000 on one, and then 10,000 or 60,000 on another. They're very different. The way I like to think about it is each of my samples or specimens is like a document. And in the document, there's a different number of words. And that's not going to bother me. So first of all, thinking in terms of words, how do we improve the quality? Well, we decided that um, the standard way of picking OTUs actually doesn't use the most inform important information from a probability viewpoint, which is the frequencies at which the strains occur. And so you need to use the, the frequencies. Otherwise, you get completely carried away in overestimating the um, number or the number of species or what's called the alpha diversity. So 
this is the same as what would happen if, suppose that I know somebody, I do, I'm married to somebody, who is a, just a pitiful speller. And you ask them, they don't use the computer, um, you know, you wonder how many words do they know, and you'd start looking at you know, texts that they write and so on, all handwritten not on the computer, and you start sampling and you start counting the words. And it looks as if they know really a lot of words. And this is what happens if you don't denoise. Now, what does Google do? When you mistype something and you have a typo, it suggests another word. What is it using? Underneath it, it's using that you have some of these words, say, adaptive, and you've misspelled it with a P first. Um, it's using the fact that adaptive occurs millions of times, and apaptive, which with the P instead, occurs three times. So it tells you how to denoise. That's what we do in data too. That's how it works. That is, we start off with the data and we just look for the most frequent. And if you're one away, if you have a typo on one, which is very frequent, then we say that's noise. And we make a formal model for it. Um, and really what's going on is, suppose that you have here, I took an example which is visual instead of words. Um, I have one sequence which occurs a thousand times and another one which occurs a hundred thousand. The error is the same, has the same variance, um, and, but the, how big your cloud is around with the number of errors for the sequence which occurs a hundred thousand times, there's many, many more opportunities for error. So this is um, what you get. And if you did the 98% um, similarity, it would define OT OTUs in the old way, you'd get this. And this is completely wrong because it's not using the fact that here I have 100,000, so I have many more opportunities for errors. So um, uh, we rewrote um, data to, um, to be very efficient. It's an algorithm we actually developed uh, more than 10 years ago. But now we have sort of a, uh, a program which runs in R with all the inside code written in C, which denoises the data and uses the data itself to construct a model, which is an error model, which takes into account both uh, the quality scores and the probability that you get from previous data. So this has been very useful in what we call you know, high resolution strain clustering. And so this is an example on lactobacillus. And you see that um, with data two, we see um, six different strains. And if we use an old fashioned method, you just see one strain. But this has had the disadvantage that there's no going back to doing differential abundance by OTUs, it doesn't work. At the strain level, you have the person-to-person -person variability, um, which becomes much higher. But it's very useful for seeing sharing of strains, and various um, models um, are based on that. It's been a, a, a big step forward, but then for us, we had to develop a whole new technology, this topic technology, for taking that into account. So here I'm going to explain to you how we think about that, about communities and transitions, and this is on an example. So this, we did several studies on pregnancy and preterm birth and finding whether we could find biomarkers, which were bacterial, for preterm birth. And in this case, the first study we did, there were 49 pregnant women, of whom 15 delivered preterm. And we took um, 40 women that we studied, and then we set aside a random set of nine, which we used as the validation set. And we had different um, body sites. Here, I'm just going to look at the vaginal microbiome. And we used you know, methods, statistical methods, based on um, the mixture models that I'm not going to go into too, de too many details of. And all the, the it, this was published at P PNAS. Um, and one of the things that we did, which has come up already, is that we found that if you make co-occurrence networks, now I'm just going to show you the, the, the matrix of co-occurrences. If there's high co-occurrence, it's very red. 
and both the rows and columns are samples. And here we have sort of blocks. And here we have a community state type um, at the top, which identifies the samples, which have very, very similar profiles, bacterial profiles. Here we have a group which is much, much smaller. And this, there's a group here, which is group four, which is extremely diverse and shares very little in common with itself and is very inco incoherent in some sense. That's where all the preterm birth occurs. It's sort of interesting, and I'll show you the picture better here. These are the actual bacteria. And here we have the community state types. And so this is this group four. This is a case, so for often for the human genome, diversity is a sign of health. Here, diversity is not a sign of health. That's where all the preterm birth occurs, uh, most of it. So highly diverse vaginal microbiome is a sign of ill health. So in this case, we were able to cluster a, an even label into these different community state types using previous publications, and this data was completely consistent with it. And so each sample could be assigned to a community state type, and we could follow it. And so here we had um, the women, the longitudinal data, where we're following the women over time. And you see that the community state types, which are the pink and the red ones, are the group four. Um, those are the ones which are associated to short pregnancies. So these are the preterm pregnancies here. And the, the, they do occur here. But they're pregnant here, this um, goes normally for most of them. So this is the first data set that we analyzed that. And we actually did a little mathematical model to find out the stability using transitions between the different state types. And here you can see, you know, 98% of the time you stay in this Markov state one. And here, this is the most variable. Um, you only stay about 68% in this group four. So we made this Markov chain model, which was useful for comparing the transitions and the stability in the different states. Now, we have been able to conclude from that, for instance, that the stability allowed us to do diagnosis early on. That is, um, if there was um, state four early on, that was actually a, a, a marker of having problems. But also, we went within that state four and try and find out who's responsible or which were the associated biomarkers. And we came across Gardnerella and Europlasma as two potential ones. And the referees said, well, you took a study group who are all from the Bay Area. It's very homogeneous with regards to race and, and socioeconomic background. You should do more. And so we did more. And we did a follow-up study. And this is the follow-up study um, from Alabama. And here we show the um, uh, different um, multidimensional scaling or PCOA plots where you see that the first study and the second study have exactly the, the results replicate as to where the different um, species occur. So we have the crispatus here, uh, Lactobacillus inus here, and these are two different strains of Gardnerella. And so we had a very good replication of the relationship between the, the different species. We do also we did something more refined because now we had data too and we were able to find that it's not all strains of Gardnerella were bad. So the particular strains which were worse and there was a follow-up study done by um, Daniela Goldsman um, and she studied the Gardnerella strains and we could find which ones. Yes, you have a question. There's also a lack of uh, lactobacilli yeah. in that population. So is that the presence of Gardnerella or the lack of lactobacilli? Well, the, the protective, uh, you could say in some sense, the protective, you don't know whether it's exclusive. It's the problem of cause and effect. That is, you don't know at the beginning what's the way. I'm involved in a follow-up study but with Gates where we're trying all kinds of, um, Gates Foundation wants to do um, proactive things. 
So for instance, in storing a community which is lactobacilli based to try to exclude others, that's one of the things that, that's being done actually clinically. And so it's, we don't know that. That is, but they are exclusive, and that's a very important point. And that it's something that I'm going to come back to because they're not independent. And I'm going to come now to something about a little bit of mathematics is good for your soul. Um, so if you've never heard of the Dirichlet, I want to tell you about it. So the multinomial model is just, we're going to start with a finite number of boxes for the time being, and we drop box, balls into boxes, and we say we have a multinomial model, um, and we count number of balls. In. That's a model which is a sort of baseline model for doing the different taxa. You could suppose that the reads get organized that way. Unfortunately, it's not sufficient. Um, the boxes in the multinomial model um, the numbers are independent, apart from the fact that, you know, if you have very, very many in one, you're going to have slightly less in the other. But that's a very small correlation just due to the total number being the same. But a multinomial model cannot accommodate exclusion or um, the, the syntropy, the fact that bacteria work together. But it's still a very good model, and I'm going to use it as the backbone of the more, uh, the better model, um, the topic model. So the number of balls is the number of reads, and the number of boxes is the number of ASVs. And as I said, we're doing de novo, so in fact, you have to imagine that the number of boxes can go to infinite. And you can have a multinomial model and know exactly what the probability of seeing any kind of configuration of number of reads in each of these boxes. But the, bo the box's contents has to be independent, which is bad. So if you do various kinds of um, hierarchical models, the first idea um, Chris Quince worked on, and that idea was that you could try maybe um, making the probabilities or the t size of the boxes random and then do a mixture over that, that still doesn't overcome the fact that you, you have independence between the boxes, but it does make them much more random. So you can think about, and I use the example of the birthday problem for balls in boxes often, why should you put in like a hierarchical prior on the boxes? Well, I teach probability a lot, and I don't know, any of you heard of the birthday problem? How many people have heard of the birthday problem? An introduction probability class, you will be told that you have to have at least 23 people in the room to have a 50-50 chance of a birthday, okay? So I used to do this a lot in class, and I always used to be very lucky get many more, and I'd have small classes of 20 students in section, and we'd often have better than 50-50, and, and then I thought, huh. But the fact is that the students were all born the same year, and so it's not, the probability isn't one over 365 over the, if they're all born the same year, there's a pattern weekday weekend for births, and so there are many more births on weekdays than there are on weekends, you know, modern medicine, uh, especially in the US, C-sections and things like that. And so, of course, that's going to increase the probability. And the way we worked it out, I wrote a paper about this, is that you make a Dirichlet prior which goes up over the week and down over the weekend, and you can make it variable that way, but you can also put in seasonal trends. And it turns out that in order to get 50-50 with true birth data, you need about 16 people in the room. So it's better than the, but the Dirichlet is very useful. And we use it for all kinds of um, setups, and it's a hyper, what we call a hyperparameter family. That is, we're putting a distribution on the probabilities. Unfortunately, the Dirichlet multinomial isn't enough. I need another layer, and this is why. The reason is a biological one, and so 
I study also the oral microbiome, and in the oral microbiome, we have cases of you know, periodontitis, and then you have pairing of bacteria on the one hand, which are methanogen, and on the other hand, the ones that um, um, use the methan. And so those pairings can't appear in a multinomial Dirichlet. Um, you need to do an extra level and that's where the topic analysis comes in. Um, it's a hierarchical model in which we're going to make topics of things which co-occur a lot. And so the, the, we're going to modify the multinomial, but the multinomial Dirichlet is the basis uh, of how it works. So this is also about interpretability and about latent variables. So. I showed you the example of pregnancy, and in the example of pregnancy, I said each sample was given one color according, according to its community state type. And now, with this topic model, we can do something better. We can give each sample several topics that they're about. And I think the easiest thing to th way to think about it, remember I was talking about words and Google earlier on, I think of the bacteria as the reads as words. And you have, your specimen is like a document. And in your document, you can look at the distribution of the words. So if I have words which are like ball, field, things like that, I think, oh, that's going to be about sports. And then, but I read a little bit later and I see some legal stuff. And so, the document can be a contract about sports, so it can have two topics. And so they, instead of belonging only to one type, it can belong to several types. So that's the advantage of the LDA, that is a topic model. And it's hugely used in natural language processing. And it's, very, it, it's a mixture model, and it's way to overcome this problem of you don't have to assign a sample to only one. Um, di cluster. So every sample is a composed of several topics. And my question is, you know, the topics are like guilds. And the generative model that we think about is if you're given a sample, you're going to pick topics at random out of a certain number of topics. And once you've picked one of your topics, then that topic has a probability distribution on words, and then you'll pick a word from that distribution. It's because it's a two-step process like that that we call it hierarchical, and it, you know, it has levels. And so this is work I did with Chris Sankaran, who's now at Mila um, doing machine learning, but he uh, still works a lot on the microbiome. And we wrote a paper in biostatistics called latent variable modeling for the microbiome. And the reason we did it was when we were looking at um, so perturbation experiments, this is um, a multidimensional scaling, or PCOA, where we have two different um, points for every patient, which are the during antibiotic stress and in their normal state. So we actually gave two courses of antibiotics, and we were trying to see the changes um, that occur. And the problem that we had was you get a plot like this, but we don't really know how to interpret it. That is, what is involved, which of the bacteria co-occurring at the same time. It's quite an unsatisfactory um, plot in the end. And so we did topic analysis on this data. And so here is the parallel that I was just talking to you about, in which you know, a term is the equivalent of a species or a strain. And the reads are like the words that occur in the text. So, you know, words can have several forms and they can be associated to the same term. And instead of a topic, I'll call it a community, but you could call it a guild, because that's what it is. It's co-occurring uh, bacteria, which um, sort of you see appear together in symbiosis. And then the whole environment is like a corpus of texts. Now, this has a huge advantage because this, these methods were developed for documents which all had different sizes. 
That is, you can have a website which has 1,000 words, and you can have a book which has um, 15,000 words. It doesn't matter. That is, you don't do any normalization or anything. Everything works perfectly. And so you can have a random number of words in your document, and this is exactly what we um, come across when we are analyzing our specimens, our samples. And again, you know, when we're doing it here, this is Pride and Prejudice. You have the word occurrences. There are actually um, numbers of reads for us are much higher, but we do have a lot of zeros, which is common. Uh, and so we have that parallel. So it turns out that, you know, latent Dirichlet allocation was already used in genetics a lot. And it's equivalent to a method um, called structure, which was developed by uh, Peter Donnelly and Jonathan Pritchard and Matthew Stevens in 2000. But so from a mathematical viewpoint, it's well understood. It's an admixture model. And it has a huge advantage because we, ha we can do uncertainty quantification. So we can develop methods for saying how sure we are about um, you know, the prevalences of certain uh, bacteria in the topic and things like that. And we can even make confidence contours uh, in the multidimensional scaling. So that's useful for designing experiments, because if you have a lot of uncertainty, that's where you want to do the next experiment. So the statistical model here that I'm going to use is one which um, has both a prior for the samples and a prior for the it's a prior distribution for the samples and a prior distri distribution also for the topics. And so we ha we're coming in, in some sense, it's a hierarchical model, but in a dual way, in both ways. So I like to say that um, Bayesian statistics, what it does is you have unknown parameters, and then you're trying to model your uncertainty about the unknown parameters by new distributions. And these new distributions, they have their own parameters. And so those parameters, you could also say, OK, I'm going to make distributions on parameters. And you could go all the way. So that's why I say it's turtles all the way down. And at some point, you're going to have to decide, OK, I'll p fix the prior for the prior for the prior to be so-and-so. But that's, that's the way I think about it. And so this is, the, this is the model we use, that we have samples. and. This is the statistical model. So we have a multinomial, but they have parameters which change all the time um, according to this Dirichlet. And we have a model. So what you get is each of the samples have a mixed membership. In this case, I did two topics. And here, these two topics, or community state types, these are mixed, and they have different distributions across the taxa. And I'm sure this doesn't say anything to you. It's not helpful. Let me show you the data. So this is the data on the time series um, in which we had um, um, two courses of antibiotics. This is the before. Um, so before the antibiotic, the, f the first course was here. Um, this is the interim. And then the second course was here. This is the second course of antibiotics. And what came out of the data, and we didn't tell the program or the model that we had any kind of dependency, but it organizes everything. You can see it's very smooth. That is, you can see the dependency. You see that the main topic, the first topic, is the bacteria, which start going down about three days after the antibiotics. Then they go back up. And then after the second course, they go back up much quicker. So that's the first topic. And then you have a second topic, which is m much less. Um, these are the ones that go back straight, straight away. And the other ones, the topics um, are sort of unmodified in proportion. And, and so, and the fourth topic, again, is just the ones that are not very represented and seem to go up after antibiotics. So th those are the main topics. Again, the choice of the number of topics, um, we use it for various um, studies. We've used it also in decontamination, this topic model. Um, the number of topics, usually we just give a larger number of topics. Technically, we can make a hierarchical model in which the topics are drawn at random from another level. 
Um, but for the time being, we just, you know, say 10 topics and just pick the ones which um, explain most of the variability in the data. And here, for instance, are the prevalences of the different families, different um, uh, across the different topics. And so here they've been organized along the phylogenetic tree. So you have the different um, families here. The ruminococcus um, are very... Um, change a lot um, during this antibiotic um, perturbation, and so that's the family that you see here. Question. Yeah. Are these topics assigned by something like K-means clustering, or? No, no. I did it with the latent Dirichlet, which I just showed you. So it's not a clustering method; it's a probabilistic model, which is based on. So here. It's based on this. This is our model. It's much more refined than clustering, because in clustering, every sample can only belong to one. Right. So here, every sample can have you know, 10, 10 topics in it. And we want to know how much it participates. It's a little bit like in the EM, where you allow you know, it's soft. So it's not hard. But it, and the way it's done, it's a Bayesian method. So we use um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, to get the posterior distribution. And here, what I'm showing you is with little box plots. So that's the uncertainty that's coming from the posterior distribution. So I, we can tell how sure we are about uh, some of the coefficients uh, we're very sure of, and some of the we're very uh, more uncertain. And you can see that these are the, the box spots uh, which are given by the posterior distribution, uh, the Gibbs sampler. So that's the topic. And this is just to show you some of the, the different bacteria that belong or um, uh, how they behave along the topics. And so here, the ruminococcus. Um, you can see, especially down the first, um, the first antibiotic perturbation, they go way down, and then they come back up, and here they go down, but then they go up much quicker. So that's in topic one, and that was the characterization in some sense of what happened in topic one. And so that happens across several different families. Um, and so the, this, this topic model. And so these are the ones which <coughs> are all working together or in the same guild in some sense. These are all these bacteria which have this same behavior. Now, that, that was step one. That's the easiest thing to understand. And um, I can't resist it. I'm going to tell you a little bit more. And it'll be painful, but you know, you can talk to me and give me a hard time at coffee or something. So the, this paradigm that we have, so I'm what's called a pragmatic Bayesian. If I know something about a problem, I like to put it in as in my prior. And I'm not a, a subjective Bayesian. I do a lot of computation, and most of my priors are built from prior data. Um, but it's very, very useful because with the Bayesian paradigm, we can do something that we can't do um, with any other kind of method, and that's quantify uncertainty. So what I just did, which was to generate a whole bunch of values for the topics, I can do it um, for all the different samples. So in this case, these samples, I've called them populations. And here, the species, I've called them OTUs. But I made a 1,000 draws from a slightly more complicated model than I won the topic model, in which, in fact, I have correlations between the topics. Um, and in that model, which is a multivariate model, the thing you should think about, don't pay attention to the formulas, is I have a data cube. And that data cube is 1,000 draws from the, what I believe to be the right generative model for the data, which is this posterior that we pull out. And I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that to try and project onto an uh, ordination plot. So we're trying to understand what's the variability. And when I started off, this is what we got. We have this. This is uh, actually uh, uh, also vaginal microbiome data. And we had, um, in this case, we had the four types. We left out one of them. And this is what we got as our uncertainty plots. And it's highly unsatisfactory. So what happened was, 
In fact, if you project, when you're doing multidimensional scaling, non-metric multidimensional scaling, PCOA, um, if you make a small change in the data, sometimes what was on the right goes on the left. Uh, because it's just the eigenvector is only defined up to a sign. And sometimes what was on the right goes up. So the first eigenvector becomes the second eigenvector. So that's what's going on here. That is, we have all of these posterior picks and we get this, so we need to do registration. Okay. And when we do registration, so that's the problem here as well, and um, all of those points should be very close. When we do registration, just like image registration, and this is just done by doing inner products between the tables, this is what we get. So this is, each one of those points is actually uh, a contour plot, and that contour plot is the whole posterior distribution probability density, so it tells them tells us that in the ordination plot, we're actually pretty sure of all the points where they project, except here we have some uncertainty. We have some wide, wide contours, and when we went back to those samples, those samples had much um, less depth. So the library size was much smaller, so we had much more uncertainty on them. The advantage over doing just a confidence interval is that it's, it's multivariate. So this is very important in understanding the, how sure we are of the multivariate relationships. Okay, I have to finish soon, but I want to tell you a few things about my philosophy about statistics. So Don Knuth is the god of computer science, and he wrote the Bible, and in it, his book on computing, he says, premature optimization is the root of all evil in coding. I would say that what happens is premature summarization is the root of all evil in statistics. And the reason why people are running into all kinds of problems in their workflow is they have information leakage. So if you have a certain sample depth, for instance, you need to keep that information all the way through. If you have a certain amount of noise in your sequences or you have batches, you need all that information to be kept all the way through. And so people try to streamline their data and make their problem cleaner, but the pro when they get to the end, there's no, there's no material left. There's no dependencies. And so we have all of these dependencies which we really need, especially across the multiple domains. So keep it all together. And we don't use p-values. So um, the packages and the resources, the things I've talked about, were all developed. So I do open source. And most of what I develop it has wrappers in R, even if underneath, in, like in Data 2, is written in C. And so we use R because we're statisticians, and it, it gives us a framework for sharing our work. And so these are some of the, the tools that you'll find that we've developed. And the, f the one thing I would say is, you know, a solution, and this is what makes this hard, this is why we need mathematics, is that you have to respect the data. You can't say, oh, the data are you know, change the data and say that there's something that they're not. And so respecting the data is really important and quality scores and probability re helped us with the data too, but it helps us all the time to keep the information. The other thing is um, always keep all the code of everything that you ever did because you will need to make a new picture for the publication, and if you can't find out exactly how you did it, and so that's why we like to, to use these um, scripts in R, and we publish all our, our code. And so, for instance, the pregnancy studies, all the supplementary material contains all our very bad R code. We don't care. We publish it, and nobody has complained about the quality of the coding. It's not very good. It's kind of, you know, uh, not very good code. But, you know, it's out there, and lots of people run group meetings, and they redo our analysis, and then we get questions, and so we can talk to you about it. But people are very shy about showing their code, and that's a shame. 
Okay, so I benefit from um, the bioconductor people who maintain the overall structure for doing um, certified R programs for, for biology and medicine, in particular Wolfgang Huber and Martin Morgan. Um, I developed a package for doing microbiome analysis called PhiloSeq, which is used by a lot of people. And that was developed by Joey McMurdy, who works in a company and who spends his Saturday trying to answer GitHub issues, and I'm infinitely grateful. Ben Callahan, who developed Data2 with me, and JJ Allaire, who runs our studio, and I still don't understand his business model. Okay, so that's... Um, my lab group, and uh, David Relman. Thank you.